Hello, everyone. Brian here from the American Kabuki Ground Crew. I'm uh, so incredibly thrilled to be here celebrating uh, this beautiful moment of now with all the amazing beings who will be listening to this call over the course of the coming days and weeks. Uh, words couldn't possibly express the level of gratitude I feel for being blessed uh, with the opportunity to play a part, even if just a small one of this um, recent unfolding events that have been taking place in this grand cosmic shift that we're currently undergoing. Now, whether everyone in the world realizes it yet or not, it truly is the most exciting time to be alive in the history of humanity, and I thank my creator every day for sending me front row VIP seats to all the action. Now, from an inner knowing that goes beyond mental comprehension, I know that we all chose to be here at this time to experience the journey we're all embarking on right now together as one people united. While we may not have been shot heralding into the new age on the 21st, at least consciously, like a great many out there predicted, we absolutely are experiencing an enormous shift in energies and massive transformations to our inner as well as outer worlds. And I know I speak for many when I say that I fully believe that the shift of the ages, which all the ancients prophesied would occur in 2012, is in fact unfolding uh, right before our eyes on a myriad of levels in each moment. Now, um, ascension isn't why, what we're here to discuss today. What we are here to discuss is the liberation of the planet and the seven billion of us that uh, call the Earth home. Now, over the past year, uh, talk of prosperity funds, whether it be in the form of NASARA, the St. Germain Trust, the Leo Wanta Funds, Reagan Mitterrand Protocol, um, all of the above have become the hot topic being discussed across every blog site and discussion board across the Internet, leaving many very frustrated and losing hope uh, that one day one of these funds could break into mainstream media and pave the way to uh, a new age of, of peace and prosperity. Now, I'm here to share with everyone that the moment we have all been waiting for is finally and, and very divinely uh, upon us. A few uh, days ago, on December 25th, an organization called the One People's Public Trust came exploding onto the scene with their first official announcement, quote-unquote. Uh, this document appears to be announcing that the United Nations, uh, the IMF, uh, BIS, uh, which is Bank of International Settlements, the Hague, the World Bank, and others have been legally and officially foreclosed upon. You know, the next part of this document, which I'll read here, has triggered an absolute tsunami of response as well as uh, very much heated debate and discussion across all the blogs and, and, and online forums all over the Internet. And this passage reads, The people, all people equally on Earth, have an individual duly verified sum, certain of five billion, that's billion with a B, uh, in lawful money of the United States of America gold and silver. Over three quintillion, five hundred quadrillion, which by the way is a three uh, and a five followed by 17 zeros, just and duly verified equity debt against the debtors. There is an additional duly verified sum certain of five billion in lawful money of the United States of America, gold and silver, for each of those people damaged by the actions and systems of the debtors. Over three quadrillion lawful money of the United States of America, gold and silver, in duly verified debt of damages against the debtors. Now, what this means exactly has been left to uh, lots and lots of speculation, obviously. Um, so today, we're here in full transparency uh, to discover the truth of, of this official announcement. Now, these passages are just a few short highlights uh, to what has now become multiple announcements by the One People's Public Trust, headed by the organization's uh, frontman, or front woman, uh, I should say, uh, Heather Ann Tutsi Giraffe. Uh, hi, Heather. Welcome to the call. Are you there? I am, Brian. Thank you. Very well. How are you this evening? I'm, I'm doing well, Heather. How are you? Oh, it's good. It's good. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And we also have on the call a special guest. We have Dee from the Removing the Shackles uh, blog site. Dee, are you with us? I am with you, Brian. Hi, Heather. Nice to talk to you again as well. Hi, Dee. <laughs> it's good to talk to you, too. Well, well welcome, to you, welcome to you both. Um, before we dive in here, ladies, let me give a little, be a little background. Uh, I've had the opportunity to get to know Heather uh, a little bit over the last few days, I, I, I truly feel like we've known each other for a lot longer than that. <laughs> but consciously, you know, our paths crossed for the first time last Friday, the 28th of December. And, and since then, 
we've exchanged a mountain of emails back and forth, and we were actually supposed to do this this talk yesterday, uh, but we ended up talking on Skype for about five hours, so we weren't able to get it get to it and get it in. So um, talking to Heather for, personally answered so many questions that I've had for myself. You know, now in the spirit of, of full transparency and, and absolute truth, uh, which are the watchwords of, of as of late, it's time to share that information with um, with the people. What do you say, Heather? Sound like a plan? Okay, perfect. So uh, for the purpose of this call today, um, Heather, uh, my role and, and Dee's role in this is, is going to be to give the the public or the people, I should say, a voice. And um, due to the scope of the subject matter we're dealing with here, uh, which is obviously global in nature with the um, potential of affecting every person on the planet, and, um, you know, because of that, the people are obviously and rightfully so have lots and lots of questions. So over the last couple of days, I've gathered many of those questions from uh, Kuila Pele's blog, American Kabuki's blog. You also sent me some questions from emails that you've received. I know Dee's probably got plenty, plenty of questions from her readers as well. So I'll be using these to uh, navigate the uh, the chat here as uh, as best we can. Does that sound good? So Heather, um, for the purpose of the, the, the we're going to call this a conversation. This is not an interview. It's a talk. It's informal. Um, my role in this, Dee's role in this is it's going to be to give the people a voice, the people, quote, unquote, all everybody that's been following this story since last Friday. Uh, obviously, due to the scope of the subject matter we're dealing with here, which is beyond, you know, it's global, it's universal in nature, really. It has the potential of affecting everyone on the planet. So there's a lot of questions that have been flowing in consistently for the for, since, since last Friday. Um, and over the last couple of days, we've gathered these questions from various blogs, you know, Dee's blog, uh, Breaking the Silence, or excuse me, Removing the Shackles, Kuila Pele, American Kabuki, and, and emails that you've sent me. So we're going to use these questions um, that people have to kind of guide us through the, the, uh, the conversation that we have here. Um, but before we start, I have one little request of you, Heather. So <laughs> okay. based on what we know of you so far... Um, I'm not going to agree to tell me what's it. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> I said I'll, I'll agree to it when you tell me what it is. Okay, here it is. Um, you're obviously very well educated. You have a, a very um, uncanny ability to articulate and express yourself around anything that you um, have done with your legal background. I know you've been a lawyer for 10 years. Uh, but um, you know as good as I do that a lot of the feedback that we've received thus far is that the format is too legalese or legal talk for the average show to understand. So um, you you put out an announcement, announcement too, that that was for very good reason because this is drafted in an attempt to um, – the people weren't the, the – uh, intended audience of the very legal stuff that you put out, but I, I really want to try to keep this as street level and uh, in a, a style and format that that everyone's going to be able to understand. Is that is that fair? That's excellent. That's more natural. <laughs> very good. All right. So so I already know the answer to this first question. Um, but I, we need to hear it from you because, you know, everybody hasn't been um, uh, present on, on the talks that we've had so far. But there, there's a lot of people out there that want to believe with, you know, their entire heart and soul that uh, the story that we're here to discuss um, is true. But because they've never heard of you or the People's Trust organization, there's been, um, you know, a fairly substantial amount of resistance. So so why don't we start out with who who is Heather and Tutsi Giraffe, and, and how on earth did you get involved in all this? Okay, well, Heather and Tutsi Giraffe is just one of the people. I mean, when it boils down to it, all the roles that I play, I'm, I'm just one of the people, just like you guys, just like everyone else on the planet. And as to why I got involved, I got involved for the same reasons all you guys got involved. We're searching for the truth. And... Here we are on this call. And then as far as when did I get involved, I was working overseas, basically, in high levels of bank and trade and finance and international law. And um, we all made a choice. We made a choice to go in and clean things up. And it wasn't just me. It wasn't just 
the people I was working with. It was a whole slew of people within what we term as the slavery systems. Um, and that happened, basically the choice was made on how it was going to go in March of 2009. Does that answer that question specifically so what, enough? What happened in March of 2009? Um, actually, we had been working on an investigation for approximately, I think it's three months, maybe less, um, regarding mirror loans at the World Bank. And we found through that mirror loans uh, investigation that we were doing regarding Panama, the Republic of Panama, uh, we found Freddie Fannie paper, Freddie Mac and, and Fannie Mae fraudulent paper, significant amounts of it. And out of curiosity for one of the people that was investigation team, I went back behind the screens and went all the way back to I had randomly selected some houses out of the Freddie Fanny uh, paper and went all the way back to the homes and found uh, that this paper, this securities of about 50 million, of, and I think it was about, yeah, it was 50 million, and it was probably based on property that was worth maybe, if you were lucky, 10% of that amount, maybe less. So with that, uh, that's basically what started it. It was a personal issue, a personal matter, a person, one of the people helping another one of the people. And from there, we just kind of sat there and readjusted, reprioritized, and really just reflected. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? And what can we do about it? Do we want to do anything about it? So people really kind of sat there and thought about it and a choice was made. So we made a choice to go in and how do we help people understand no loans are made. There's no such thing as lawful current funds. There's lawful money, but there's no lawful current funds. So, you know, these are the decisions we had to make. We were watching everyone suffer. We were suffering. You know, even those in the highest levels of banking are suffering. Highest levels of purported government are suffering. Um, all the way down, you just you get tired of it. So that was on a that was the very beginning. Does that answer that? I mean, as far as what ended up to this phone call? Yeah, a- a- absolutely. And you know, Heather, from talking to you yesterday for as long as we did, I know that your 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 story and your background. We could sit here and we could talk about it for hours, if not if not days, really. Um, but really. You know, from here, what I want to kind of the direction that I think everybody wants to see us go is, uh, you know, the next phase in your in your your journey was the decision to start the um, investigation that um, culminated in the putting out of the paradigm report. Is that accurate? Yeah. In fact, I mentioned the Fannie and Freddie papers, and basically it was just taking the culmination of all the investigations we had worked up to at that point. And when we made the decision, in between the time that we found the Freddie and Fannie papers and, then in, and the decision to do the uh, investigation, we needed to figure out exactly what needed to be done. And so it was sort of like a, a trilogy type of protocol where we had to go in and figure out many aspects to the investigation and alter them based on the results real time. So that's what the paradigm report was. It was a field report. Yeah, there's a lot of mistakes in there, typing-wise, uh, grammatical spelling. The point is, is the, subs- the substance uh, inside the report. That was the important part. And really, we were asked, can, can the private system even be saved? Is it worth saving? Um, and the answer was no, it could not be saved. And why put energy into something that can't be saved? Okay. So what what was it that went into develop the, you know, the paradigm report? That was research that spanned over the course of a matter of, uh, I think you said it was about two years. So what were you researching? And uh, what was the... What was the final outcome? I know people can obviously they can read this document for themselves, but really what people want to know is what went into it. What was the um, what was the outcome, 
And ultimately, what was the objective that you were looking to accomplish with you and uh, the people that were involved in, in getting that paper put out? What went into it? Body and soul. A minute. <laughs> Um, as far as the goal was, like I said, to go in and find a solution, identify the problems, and identify a solution. And, and could it could the solution incorporate some of the framework that was already existing, or did it have to be completely mowed down and built from scratch? That's basically the essence, you know, and it had to deal with banking. Um, was obviously the nexus point of every problem on the planet. So the problem at that point needed to be identified back to, well, how did that problem even come into existence? And you go back to the history, uh, you go back to the history of America and the first two central banks that they attempted to do, and the report identifies that more historically people can refer to that part. Um, but looking at the past allowed us to figure out, okay, well, how did they maneuver using education and the judicial system? And then after that, it was a matter of, okay, well, what right now is their biggest fear, which communication between people, so the Internet. Identifying these markers or these factors allowed us to be able to go in and say, okay, we need to go in further because a paper trail needs to be made where no paper trail currently exists, at least not one that connects all the dots. Um, at that point, we had a few people that had offered to go ahead and use their house as a test case and, and all of that. And out of, I would be running basically an investigation. It ended up just being a logical choice that I would have to use my house as a test case so I could control all the different factors. You know, it's one thing to try to help someone who's freaking out out while you're trying to run an investigation. Uh, and it's much easier to just control yourself and go through the factors. And, and so, I have so, the most information with the most well-rounded database out of all all of us. So, okay, that's how it started. So essentially, you put yourself up for allowing your your home to go to foreclosure, um, and and in order to be a test subject for tracing the fraud that needed to be committed against you to get you out of your property back to the source of where the fraud was coming from so you could accurately track that, that paper trail, correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, essentially, I was headed over to Switzerland anyways to take over presidency of a, of a company, and they were currently looking for a house. I had gone in with someone else, and basically it was kind of like, okay, this is her pet project. We all have projects that we really – had close to home that we were cultivating. Some were agricultural projects, helping feed humanity. Some were energy projects, getting free energy to everyone. And those are very quiet projects because it ruffles a lot of feathers. Um, mine just went along with the base and the experience that I've had and the training I've had, which was corruption, law, had to do with law. And what it came down to as of this moment People are have the opportunity to see that, you know, the conjunction of law with the financial system, with the purported government system, with these private systems that we believe have been for the people, by the people, um, everyone can kind of see where it all has to go back to the law. It has to go back to the law of what? Okay. So, so you have, yeah, yeah, absolutely does. So you have this, because I'm, I'm trying to – Put the pieces together in a chronological order. So you have this paradigm report. Let's call that phase. Let's call that phase one. You, what, what were the? What was the expectation to? Now you got this paradigm report that has these findings that um, the system is broken, essentially, in a very rudimentary way of saying it, and it, it can't be fixed without making some major changes to the structure of uh, the way that society is managed by all the people at the top, correct? Yeah, I mean, essentially, and when that report went out, what really excited me, Brian, was in December 10th of 2010, or two, uh, December 11th, I was introduced to someone who was involved with this thing called the public trust. And I'm not a history buff, or had never 
traditionally been a history lab. And I was introduced to concepts of basically founding fathers. I mean, of course, we all know that to some degree. Constitution, yes, we probably have all at least looked at a copy, if not read one. Yet to go in and really feel it, you know, they just sort of moved my world. And I was looking for that clean spot. Where can you clean this from? Because you have so many people in the slavery system who were trying to clean it up. And they have all the power to do it. But the question was, why were they doing it? Well, there has to be a clean spot to do it from so that nobody can rebut it, so that it's unrebuttable and therefore unrebutted. And that is where I found the public trust to be an amazing tool because it, it did go back to crime, but then it had to go back even further. We weren't all the way back to crime until this last summer. Well, and that gonna- was back to create you're gonna have to you're gonna have to um, talk about what you mean in regards to taking it all the way back to prime. Sure, you know it's just kind of simple. We have notice of it every day. Every day that a child is born, every day that a body leaves this earth, you know it's a matter of creation. There's these bodies, and yet who's the architect? Who's the original architect? I work a lot with patent law, trademark law. And yet, at the same time, I watch all these patents and all the technology be stolen. Where? From within the patent office itself. You know, so when you go back to Prime, you've got to go all, all the way back to Prime. Who's the creator? In the instance of a science or a patent, it would be the person that actually thought up the darn thing. You know, wanted to apply it. Because they know the DNA of it. They were inspired enough to create it. What's well, the same thing here? Who created the people? And if you look at every religion across the board, every religion proffers it's, it's the creator. So I had to go back in and really kind of look at that. I was raised in a Jesuit Catholic home, but studied many religions. Um, and I found it to be useful. Not only that, but it was also the loophole for certain banking families to also protect their things um, from the systems that they were enforcing against everyone else, against their will. So creator is the prime. Nobody can come up and say, I own your body, I own your mind, because first off, you do. And then second off, who are you a servant to? You know, and then you take that into a commercial world, which is where they hid everything. Either someone's going to claim you as the servant or you're going to claim yourself as owning yourself. You're free. If anyone that you serve, it would be your creator, whether you want to call him the creator, God, source, uh, Yahweh, Allah, it doesn't matter. The point is going back to prime and nobody can rebut that. It's unrebuttable and it's unrebutted. Okay. That so- yeah, absolutely. So essentially what you're saying is that we we as the people have um handed over uh or bowed down to um uh laws and and rules that have been put forth against us illegally and the only reason that um they've been able to manage them this long is because we've given our consent. So is, I mean is that kind of in a in a real basic way of saying it kind of what's what's happened here over the course of the last 100 years if not way longer yeah i would say that's a very accurate truth okay the way that you just stated it okay so you got this paradigm report um and what was the you you went in you you laid a lot of groundwork you let your home go to foreclosure you did this great amount of research and 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 study into these systems and how corrupt they are what are you now doing with this document? Like, I'm trying to bring it forward to present moment so we can dive into where we are today. Um, but there's obviously this 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 big vision from you and the people's trust uh, that you're working toward. And w- I'm just trying to figure out for everybody that's listening to this what that was and that, and what your roadmap was to ultimately get there. No, I mean I've worked in banking. You know, in the basically putting people in, in tight positions and ferreting things out, vetting assets, vetting out people, doing background checks and all that. So I had a lot of information of how banks worked. And while we're going in trying to figure this cleanup, uh, I wanted to make sure we were under the radar. 
once the banks kind of figure out you've gone in to squeal or tell on them, an, an exorbitant amount of pressure is applied or more. So it was really important to go in and work all this stuff out because I hadn't been in a courtroom for quite some time. I had no idea about it. So my job allowed me in the paradigm report basically to figure out how to go in and ferret everything out and be able to sort of test out different areas of solution. So in banking, I, I was responsible for vetting assets. I was responsible for vetting people. I was responsible for creating policies, structures, contracts, um, all for banking and financing. And so I know the exorbitant amount of pressure they can put on people and the methods they do that, uh, which are pretty distasteful. Um, so I knew what to expect. So I designed the investigation so that I could be under the radar while I was trying to work out the on-ground part, bring the investigation from the bottom up. Okay. Without thanks knowing. Okay. So what, what, what point um – Around what time, uh, as far as what month and what, what year were, was all of this going down? Because I'm, I'm trying to get a little bit of history here. Because you, you put out your announcements on December 25th. You've had a couple announcements since then. What groundwork were you laying during that, the, the, from when you finished that paradigm report until where you are today? I mean, what was going on in the background um, behind the scenes of all of this? What, what, was, what were all the... Uh, puzzle pieces that were getting put into place in order for everything that we're going through right now, everything that we're experiencing right now to become a possibility. Okay. Well, I had already investigated for a couple of years and been a part of the banking structure. So we knew where the nexus was. The next part was, was to figure out how to go in and make it since the banks control everything was to how to go in at where to go in number one and how to go in and basically unwind or unbound their support structure. So the bar, the judicial, and, of course, the education. Media was another one. Um, however, we didn't want the media. We didn't want any of that because if people knew what we were doing, we, wouldn't, we never would have finished our job, ever. Um, so with the... With the uh, judicial, that was the important and probably the easiest point for me to go in and start in the trenches to build the investigation from the bottom up or from street level to Wall Street level, okay? So with that, uh, using my house as a test case, I went in and I, I don't even know how many cases that were actually filed or how many briefs were actually tested to get to the final brief that I sent in approved, which was a set of acts and practices brief. So that's basically what I did for almost a year. I was in the trenches, actually a year and a half, was in the trenches testing the judicial to see how corrupt they were, how closely connected they were with the banks. Were, was it direct contact? Were there people in between? Were there handlers? Um, how... How much access did banks have to the systems that were actually used in judicial, meaning like CourtSmart, which is a communications recording system that the courts use during hearings? Uh, how much access did they have to the clerk's office? I mean, what I discovered was pretty mind-blowing for someone that had been an attorney for 10 years. And during this investigation, I actually had to make a choice, uh, especially when I received intel and reports on ongoing investigations regarding the bar, which I was a part of. And I ended up canceling my, my uh, bar license during the investigation. So that was the, the main meat of it, and we just finished that basically this July of 2012. Uh, well, the end of June, I think. End of June of 2012. 
And then the third part, the third phase, was coming over here and working with the powers that were to go in and implement a solution that was the easiest and the less stressful for the people. Because I was told at one point, in fact, right before I left for overseas, was that there was going to be a war. There was going to be a war of such a kind that it has never been seen or known in existence. And that was unacceptable to me. So out of the trustees, I was the one that was most suited to go overseas so that people knew that this wasn't about just America, quote-unquote, or about people on the American soil, quote-unquote. This was about people all over the globe. So that's what I've been doing over here, and I actually had a job. We were using – I was offered a, a job as a director of a bank, a private bank in Spain, and that was arranged through, in fact, one of the main clients is Rothschilds. So that was supposed to be our quiet room behind doors where we could actually go in and try to hammer out a solution for implementation. Well, when the time came, it didn't feel right. And I never made it to Spain. I didn't go there. Um, after some long discussions with the trustees, we felt that it just it wasn't right. Um, Heather, real quick, not to interrupt, um, there's going to be people that are, are, are going to um, have some confusion based on a couple of things that you just said. You said that you were working with the powers that were and that you were working with the Rothschild family to find a solution. Um, uh, there's many out there that perceive, uh, you know, the powers that were there. That's that's the cabal. That's the bad guys. The Rothschilds are, um, you know, part of those those dirty Illuminati family bloodlines. But you were working with them. Can you explain how that works? Well, we weren't working with them. We were opening our doors to be able to go in with the powers that were to start the handover back to the people. We we physically went to their houses. We physically opened our doors so that there could be an open communication. They were very fearful of that because they just they didn't want to let go of the of the power, of the control. And in some cases they you know still don't, but it's already done. Okay. Alright, so you said um when we talked last night you said there something big happened on the um, 4th of July. There is some big turning point event that happened on the 4th of July, and I believe there was another one in December. What were those? And those would be good lead-ins to everything that we've, we've, that we've seen um, come out from, uh, from yourself and the People's Trust in la- over the last couple of days. What were those? Uh, yeah, it's... Um July July 4th, basically what we did was announce that we're going to do the equity call. They'd had so many chances, and we there was so much communication going back and forth um, trying to hammer this out and make sure that everything was returned to the people, that on July 4th, the trustees just said, you know, we can either sit here and wait for someone to do something especially from a bunch of folks who just were fearful of giving control back, you know, and being found out that we decided it, it was time to do instead of waiting for others to do. So we issued the order, and there was an order issued on July 7th, and it was delivered to them. And actually, it had been pre-issued as a notice uh, the month before. So this time we registered. We registered that into the system, so that was July 4th. October, it was funny because everyone started talking about an October surprise, and we were surprised because we thought we were being very, very quiet, and we kept everything quiet. Uh, but in October, we, we actually foreclosed on all the private systems, the slavery systems, which included private arms of the slavery systems of the United Nations, purported United Nations, purported Hague, purported IMF, ICC, ICJ, uh, and all of the corporates, corporations, okay. under the guise of government. Okay, so um, that, was in October. that was in October. Okay, so D, D has a quick question. I want to know once D asked her question, under what authority um, the all the foreclosures were made and whether those were registered. 
but D, why don't you hop in? You, you have a question? Okay. I have just just a tiny question. Uh, as you're talking about, uh, you were just talking about the different cases of who was, uh, some were maybe not falling into place or maybe not playing nicely. Could you maybe tell us who it is who wasn't playing nicely? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> well, basically you had what we call the Texas camp. <laughs> what we know is the Texas camp. <laughs> Which consists of who? <laughs> <laughs> well, that I don't mind. That's fine. Um, <laughs> traditionally, Texas camp consists of Bush Sr., Bush Jr., uh, Clinton, um, let's see, uh, Rumsfeld, and Cheney, for the most part. There's others, but, you know, those are probably the names that everyone would be most familiar with. No, not J. J. R. Ewing. <laughs> so that's Texas. But then another another question was, of course, the Rothschilds, and that would be um, Zurich. We, the Rothschilds we found just lovely, to be very, very lovely. And we had a fun time with Rothschilds London, but they weren't having such a fun time. So it was really London Rothschilds and the Rothschilds in France. So those are the two um, on that side. And then there was the old man on the, and the Asian family. Uh, they were very supportive. They wanted everything to come out. The old man in Asia wanted everything to come out and wanted all the truth. And it was a particular man named General Wong, uh, Wang Lun Shui, that, uh, Wang Shui Lun, excuse me, that was always interrupting and messing things up. Uh, I would like to state, though, I've met him, and I found him quite pleasurable just on a personal level, but when it comes down to what's happening worldwide, uh, it's just unacceptable. So those were the main parties, and maybe hopefully that will put into perspective a few questions that people have regarding uh, the Asian side. Yes, definitely. Yes, and as I said to you earlier on today, Heather, uh what you were saying about General Wong definitely rings with what I've been getting for intel uh, back in October, especially uh, when he was on American soil and apparently screwed everything up quite royally while he was there. You know, it's funny because um, most people don't know, but, and I don't even think Fulford knows, but a lot of our communications regarding negotiations of how to kind of reset everything was done using Fulford. So I would sit there and wait for his things to come out so I could see what kind of proposal came next. And everything was always set in, what, Japan? So I sat there, and when you were talking about General Wong, we were supposed to have meetings with uh, the old man. Didn't matter where in the world. He was actually going to come to Europe. Um, and we were headed on our way to Switzerland anyways for BIS. Um, and so anyways, we didn't have the meeting. Something had happened. And I didn't find out till just before we decided, you know what, screw it. We're going to go to, to Switzerland. Um, but it, it was General Wong who was in the middle of that as well. And supposedly General Wong had been removed from the situation. Not so – he had been kind of swept to the side and, you know, you're no longer – you're no longer captain of the team here. And – Although they had done that, we had already made plans, and we went. We went to Switzerland. We gave them a chance. We gave them an opportunity, and it turned out that our particular presence and our our work that we were doing there that day or that week was used to kind of force a hand of one side of the family so that things could get reset. But anything less than returning everything to the people was – Still not acceptable. So here we are, and things are finishing, yes, but everything was already done. The people hold and own everything. Equally. Okay. So, so real quick, real quick, Heather, um, the question coming up is, I know we've talked about it before, but there's going to be a lot of people that are confused by who you mean by the old man. Yeah, I know. There's <laughs> People outside of banking do get confused about the old man. So, in fact, I think one question was, is that George Bush? No, that's not George Bush Sr. Uh, the old man is basically China. 
He's the head of at least uh, what I know to be the elders, sort of like a chairman. Um, he was formally seen last, uh, for my information, as an emperor in China. So the communist government, I kind of giggle when people talk about the communist government in China, although I do respect the people that I've worked with over there. Uh, the communist is, regime is just an illusionist as much as democracy. Okay, Anything that divides is dividing in order for management and control. There is just the people, and there is just the creator. That is prime. So when I talk about the old man, that's who I'm talking about. And I met with his daughter in 2008, which is when I met General Wong and had the meeting with General Wong. So that's where we are. Is that it kind of explained? He's very, very old. Don't ask me his exact age. He's very, very old. <laughs> Hence the in, old man. In, <laughs> <laughs> Got Hence it. the old man. Okay. So, so why don't you real quick, because there's, there's some questions I'm going to bring up here from some of the readers. Um, give a background on all this money. You know, where, w- how much is there? Where is it sourced? Where is it? I mean, what's what's the what's the full story for anybody that's coming on that's talking about? You know, we're talking about here um, the that these funds are about to be released. Some people have no idea what any of this means. They 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 have no idea um, what the background is on the sources of of this gold and silver. Can you just kind of bring us up to speed and give us maybe the Cliff's Notes version on um, uh, your uh, knowledge of of that or your the history of that or however it is that you want to explain it? Okay. Well, first off, the the value itself, the absolute underwriting of the value is the people all over the planet. The value and the power is is what you guys are actually giving to them in order for them to underwrite what they call paper money, current funds, currency. So those are just representations. Okay. And then... The gold and the silver was a representation of value that was accepted. Uh, specifically, it was accepted within the Constitution of the United States of America. And it was agreed to because, for instance, all the central banks around the entire world, people don't know, but all, all the countries and all the banks, they're all under one umbrella. And then there's different families that operate under that umbrella. And with a family, there's sibling rivalry. Okay. So with these gold and silver, there it was held in various locations. Uh, things have been relocated as of recent, uh, probably for good last year. And hardcore with the remaining amounts for about the last four months. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because anybody that follows, um, that's read uh, David Wilcox's Financial Tyranny, uh, um, story that he put out on, on divinecosmos.com. I mean, you can literally go in and look at pictures, all sorts of pictures with vaults of gold and, 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 you know, just stacks and stacks of gold bars. But how have you determined how much there, there is? You know, I mean, yeah, it sounds like we are now in control. Well, we, we the people or the people that are about to release this gold, um, to humanity are in control of it, but how do you know how much there is out there? The numbers that I put or that I used don't reflect accurately the amount that is out there. There's more than that. That's, that's one. Number two, you're seeing that um, a lot of tungsten, gold-wrapped tungsten bars are out there floating around uh, at the street levels at this point. Well, they've been in the banking levels forever. That was a huge, huge concern. That's why uh, with gold bars in gold transactions, first off, to get a bank to even transfer physical gold is like going to hell because it's very difficult. They don't want to let it go. Part of the reason they don't want to let it go is because it's all gold-wrapped tungsten uh, in a lot of cases. And that's because the gold was actually ferreted away into different locations. Okay. Okay, so... Um, I know that, yeah, there was a joke about, I think, um, American Kabuki posted that. Uh, it wasn't a joke, actually. I, I meant it regarding the tungsten, gold wrap tungsten bars. And all of a sudden, we went to BIS in October. October 22nd through the 24th, we actually went in to go inspect the gold holdings. 
And after we came home on October 27th, all of a sudden everyone was demanding to see their vocal wings. And then American Kabuki posted something that I did with Jonathan uh, Betts, and a couple days later the queen, the purported queen of England went to go check her vocal wings. So this is a – there's no problem. The gold is safe. It's secure. And it is going to be released, but I believe, it, from what it sounds like, is is that they would like to have a representation of that gold. And remember, the gold and silver is just a representation of the true value, which is inside every person. Okay. So here's where the the people, the readers of all the blogs, are going to want us to dive as as deep as we can go to or to bring some clarity, because this is where all the questions are coming up. So, um, how, what people want to know is how, how can everyone know for sure that what you're talking about is real? And, but I, by real, what I mean is that it's actually going to do some good, that this money is really going to come out. I mean, many are very skeptical at this point, rightfully so. It's a lot of money, um, because they've seen things like the Neil Keenan lawsuits, um, Drake's so-called green light, uh, prediction come and go without anything to show for it as, as far as in the public eye, based on our conversation, and I know yesterday that something actually did happen on July 4th, but nobody's been able to see anything yet. So there's a lot of people out there that are wondering, this is, is this all fairy tale, or is this for real? So what makes what we're dealing with different? Uh, what, can you take, uh, what can you tell people that will help them walk away from this call um, with a feeling that uh, in their gut that something big is about to go down here? I mean, what what assurances do do are do people have, or is it all boiled down that it, that it's just got to be completely blind faith until um, the writing's on the wall? No, actually, it's all out there. It's already out there. So we we heard all along. Okay, we weren't ignorant to everyone going. We want transparency. We want we want to know. We want disclosures. We want an event. We want money. We need we need help. We want our we want to fire all of Congress, whatever it was. We heard it all. And the best way that we knew how to help was to go in and secure everything so that it could be right there for the people to go and use lawfully and legally. There's, it's, nobody can contradict it. Okay. So when we went there, if you look at all the documents that we filed, every single one of them that we posted – um, you even have records or American Kabuki, and I gave it to D for removing the shackles as well. And I mean, it, it belongs to the people, but that record shows when everyone had notice. So there's the filing date, and believe me, it took me about oh, sometimes two to three days max to get the UCC verbiage ready. Um, and there were a number of times when we sent it over email which is heavily monitored thanks to our server going through Microsoft Exchange. Microsoft works very closely with the private systems because it is part of the private system. Um, so they actually had notice of what we were doing, what we were intending prior to us even filing. But if you look at the filing dates and then you piece together those dates, okay, then you go back and you look at any intel or any D, D and I talked about this. If she went back and looked at her intel, looked at significant dates, which I know are significant in her, her, uh, her arena, she would be able to perhaps, and we already did a couple, was to correlate the filing dates with intel dates that she had that were pretty close. Yep, filing absolutely. Dates were, yeah, the filing dates were happening before, before the date she was receiving intel, which is normal. And... and uh, if you go and you do that for each and every filing, I think you're going to find, and, and even look in just the open public reporting, even uh, mainstream media, what you guys call mainstream media, you'll see different reports. D, I loved when you posted, uh, it helped me because I didn't have to go fish for the information, all the different government officials, quote-unquote, and quote-unquote governments, whole governments that were resigning. Uh, American Kabuki, and I'm not sure if Dee did this too, where you guys kept track of all the bankers that were resigning. If you go back and look at the dates when the resignation started, uh, the, the jumping of ships, so to speak, I, the, I think, I know you're going to find that they correlate to certain kinds of filings within the pack that we've posted and that are available to everyone. 
D, go ahead with your question. When AK, when American Kabuki and uh, uh, published all the the initial reports and papers, mm-hmm. um, I immediately got flooded with emails and, of course, comments on RTS asking, "Oh my goodness, does does this mean that the Saint Germain Trust?" isn't real or that the prosperity packages, uh, the wanta money, the, the world global settlements, uh, and you and I talked about this a little bit this afternoon, and I'd like you, if you could just address that, because I know that that really panicked people when they read some of the, the information that this meant that all of a sudden these other things they've been waiting for are not going to happen. I would just like it if you could address the people and let them know a little more about that. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, first off, oh, I've worked on most of that stuff in one form or another. I worked on it, um, including heritage funds, uh, any kind of accounts. I'll have to go back and look through my email. I have someone within the old slavery system was trying to get us to open up certain of the collateral accounts, which I know are watched twenty four seven, and there are certain alarms that go off globally whenever they try to touch them. So here's the problem. I went back during the investigations and kind of looked at, okay, what are the problems? Why can't they touch this? Why can't they touch that? Who's got a hold of this? Who's trying to get in that? And it's messy. It's really messy. Yet the value is there. Okay, value is real. It's the problem of the structure that it was being held in. So in order to assist those that are the custodians and wipe away all of the rubbish, all of the barnacles that were growing on it, uh, whether it be Texas camp, whether it be any of them, okay, was to take it back to prime. So now all the value is still sitting there. It's still sitting where it was before. The only thing is it's in a clean spot, an absolutely impenetrable spot where it's safe and it can now be used. It can be released because they have all the legal and lawful basis and documentation to show ownership, to be able to show authority, standing, and the value. So, yeah, it's still all there, and and it's actually in a much better spot than it ever was prior to this happening. Thank you. That is fantastic. I hope all my readers out there are all cheering and jumping up and down now. (laughs) Based on reading the comments on your blog, Dee, I'm I'm absolutely sure they are. Uh, um, Here's a question for you, Heather, that came from a woman named Charlene. She writes, I would like to know when we can expect this to start affecting our current system. What what, uh, What steps can body of states take so this doesn't get swept under the carpet and with all those great email addresses published Rothschilds, FBJ, DOJ, Federal Reserve, etc. Is there a time that states of body should make their voices known with these entities and lastly are there any possibilities of recourse from the cabal as a lot of questions all tied into one. Why don't we start with the first why don't we start with the first one the first one was what what um, when can we start to expect to see this affecting our current system obviously that's a huge one. It already is affecting our current system. If you if you look at the governments, quote unquote, that have been reorganizing or just completely going away, it's already started. In order for there to be a mass distribution, I mean, you're talking about over some some billion people, Brian, and so you got to have the systems to be able to do that. Now there are systems that are currently existing. And we actually put all the different legal and lawful uh, tools and documentation that they need to be able to have the standing and authority to go in and repossess those, to use them. And we always use, in our group, we always use in, uh, a t- in a twinkling of an eye. It could be done in a twinkling of an eye, okay? And it can be still. And it looks like it's moving into that particular framework. I know that the the monetary system, they knew what we were doing months ago. So they've already got it all ready to go. That's why we move so hard and maybe not in a twinkling of an eye for some, but in a twinkling of an eye for what we had to unwind. Okay? 
Okay. So at this point, I want to make sure that I answer that particular part of the question. Well, yeah, you did, but there's going to be a lot of people that say, okay, well, that's that's great, that's good and dandy and all, but um, when when is this stuff, when is this information going to become public knowledge as opposed to having to dig into the blog sites to find it? You know, that's that's kind of the burning question that everybody wants to know. You know, everybody's just, everybody's waiting to wake up and turn on CNN and uh, for Anderson Cooper to come on saying, breaking news, nobody's going to believe this, here's what's going on. I mean, I, that's that's kind of where everybody's at because they've been, in their opinion, you know, for, for me, the way I look at it is over the course of the last year, there's so much that's been accomplished behind the scenes that it's all paving the way in order for everything to be made public. But I guess everybody's waiting for that tipping point to where this now is out there for the for the neighbors that have no idea what's going on for the people that are at work for our friends and family they can see it with their own eye and they know oh my gosh change is upon us yeah that is that is literally uh one of the most driving questions of the day i found on rts people it you know yes everyone you know everyone's broke everyone needs money um this, looking beyond that, though, the, the real driving question is, when are the announcements coming? When well, I, I will don't people even know? I don't even know if that's it, D, because from what I can understand, the only reason they want to know when the announcements are is because what the real question is, is when am I going to be able to rub a couple of coins together and buy a cup of coffee or a tank of gas or a loaf of bread, yep. right? Yep. yep. That's what they want to know. So here's yeah, what you know, I, no, I also think that there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people out there who have been waiting, who, who, who have been waiting for that moment of vindication of, see, I was right. I've been trying to tell you how corrupt everything is. You wouldn't listen. I just want to know that I was right, that, that I'm, I'm not crazy. Well, you know, I was talking to Brian about this because it's sort of like that joke, Brian and and Bill and I, and I were talking about, you know, a guy stranded on an island and he a boat comes by and offers him help. He says, no, God's going to save me. And then, you know, all these vehicles come forth to help him off this island. He says, no, 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 God's going to save me. And then he actually eventually dies. And he gets a to God and he says why didn't you try to help me <laughs> God's like I sent you a boat I sent you a helicopter <laughs> I mean that's sort of where we are the people if they're going to sit and wait for someone else to do something for them are they standing in responsibility are they standing in liability and I guess then the question would be that they'd ask okay well I am really I'm ready to stand in responsibility and liability how do I do that so those are really kind of the questions that I get. And I bring this up because when we were doing the solution in our part of the, the whole complete solution that's unfolding now, okay, was we had to recognize universal law and accept it. And part of that universal law is free will choice. There were a lot of people that made choices that if they had the opportunity to be abundant, live in harmony, know that someone wasn't going to come knock on their door, uh, stealing them, gagging them. I mean, it's ridiculous what banking does. However, they would make a choice that's much different than the one they had to make based on where they were. They imposed limits on themselves or allowed others to impose limits on them. So it's important that everyone is able to make a new choice, to make a different choice. So if I sit here and I go, okay, it'll be in three weeks. It'll be in two weeks. It'll be in two days. Okay? It'll be in a twinkling of an eye. I tell you, it can be in a twinkling of an eye. But I'm also going to set a time frame here by doing that that forces people to make a choice to conform to that timeline. And right now there are choices being made. They are remaking choices within that slavery system. Now, the ones that have been hiding in the slavery system to allow and help manifest this new now are coming out, and they're ready to come transparent. They're coming transparent. So you have to be aware and open your eyes so that you can see them, number one. Number two is those that were in the slavery system felt they had no other choice. 
they're actually considering and making different choices now. So you, it is unfolding right now as we speak, and you guys are making that happen. Not just American Kabuki, not just Brian, not just D, and removing the shackles. All the people that are commenting, they're seeing all those comments. They're seeing the energy of acceptance of this now, this new now that is manifesting. They're seeing that the people, because the people choose, the people decide. So I hope that everybody understands that. As far as the timing, I would love to tell you what the timing is. I know that for us, we just decided to go ahead and do. Instead of waiting for the old man to come over and do this meeting, or instead of waiting for Texas Camp to back off and let this go, uh, these collateral accounts to be released, we just went in and said, okay, what action can we do to make this safe? We realize nobody's moving or people are moving in ways they shouldn't because the right tools aren't in place. So what tools can I do to help them move? And that's what every one of us asked, and so we went in and did it. Okay. So so here's the question. Um, the something called the announcements keeps getting br- uh, brought up. The annou- here's one, one of one of the announcements. One of the announcements going to be the the question. Came, one of the questions that came in from Kuila Qu- Pele's blog. This guy named Steve. He asked. So can somebody please tell us, the people, in good old-fashioned 3D English, how all this grand language is actually going to be implemented? What are the, what are the protocols and procedures that are developing behind the scenes that allows the people to take their freedom back from the, um, from the corrupt slavery systems that have controlled us for so long? Well, I mean, the freedom's already back. First, you could just recognize and accept that. Hey, I'm free. Okay, that's one. Two is be free. If you're free, act like you're free. And the tools that we were talking about was, yeah, if I be free and I am free, I'm going to act free. What do I do when, you know, a senior cop pulls me over? You know, first thing, be gentle, be kind, be respectful, because, number one, he is a human being. Regardless of what his hat is that he's wearing and all of that, he is a human being. Now, he may be a not-so-nice human being, and <laughs> that's something to deal with later, but just go in and be, and then ask questions. Ask the right questions. You know, that's great. What's your name? What's your badge number? Perfect. Can you, now, can you write that down for me? You want everything in writing. So these are the tools, but other than that, there's nothing left to file in the UCC for all the old stuff. There's nothing left in the UCC that you need to file to say, I am a being, I am alive, I am this or that, common law is my law, it's already done. All you have to do is know that declaration of facts uh, so that you're able to incorporate it in whatever matters before you right now. And that's what one of our advisors is gracefully allowing here for me to go in and alter so I can sanitize it, take out personal information, is the template of how she's using it to test it um, in the past, it's been refined, so now it's the final version, is to be able to go in and say, okay, the UCC declaration filed by the People's Trust number, whatever it was, they just put UCC number, put the number, and then say, I am free. And then they can look back at that, but it's already in the system. It's already noticed to all the required parties. It's already cured, and there's already a commercial bill that's already been done. But you refer to it in whatever personal matter pops up after the fact. Got it. Okay. It makes sense, but here, here's, the, here's the lingering question from, from a lot of people is that, and Katie, the, I got part of this from an email that you forwarded me um, between you and Katie. Katie asks, um, you can take the people out of slavery, but how do you take the slavery out of people? Uh, you know, because there's there's so many people right now. I mean, D's got a big following on her blog. AK's got a big following on his blog. Um, Kuila Pele's got a big following on his blog. But for all of us, there's still millions of other people out there that are completely blind to all of this information. 
And they, they, until they know that something's changed, they're not going to be in a position of being able to say, hold on, wait a minute, you don't have any authority over me. I am my own authority because I only, the only person I answer to is God. So until that happens and the people are made aware that this has, I mean, the UCC filings, all this stuff, it's all great, but until that's made uh, public on a mass level, um, we there. What's how how do how can people be expected to take those kinds of actions to stand up for their rights? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. So I, what I'd like to do is use a a, a real time example. If that's okay with you guys, you know, it's uh, you have OWS, the big report that came out regarding the, the collaboration between the banks, the big banks, and the FBI, and all of that. Regarding the people, well, most people don't know. The public trust met with Occupy Wall Street. We we spoke with the founder, one of the main founders, architects of Occupy Wall Street. Now, Occupy Wall Street was started by the banks. It was started by the banks in order to cite riots so that they could implement certain agendas and protocols and policies that they needed in place. Except for it got out of control. Why? Because the people were more awake today than when they formulated the plan. And the plan was formulated decades ago. Okay? And they've been testing it throughout those decades up to the present moment. So when we told the founder, and basically he was a good guy, good intent, all of that stuff. Yeah, they they know how to pick the right ones to be the face. And I'm not the face of the public trust. I mean, that's the whole point of it. It's about the people. So they used this guy with his intent, his his good heart, and wanting to fix the system. They put him out in the front, and here's OWS. But yet they fed it. They fed it with some financing. They fed it with plants. So that's essentially what it is. You've got to look around and support each other. I'm free. You are too. How can I help you understand that? <clears throat> I mean, Heather, that makes a lot of sense. It, it, it does. Um, you know, this is, I guess, I guess the reason I'm so passionate about this is because it's something that I personally have been getting hung up on for so long, which is um, the people don't know they're free yet. So we can go, t- we can have every single one of us talk to 10 other people, and that still doesn't scratch the surface of the entire population of the world. You know, this is a, we, you've said it a million times. This is not an American thing; it's a global thing. And um, you know, there's there's obviously there's this plan that's being in, de- in that's been in development for a very long time behind the scenes with the CIA and with the, the the federal marshals and the positive military groups and the you know the new governance that has uh, been forming. Um, you know. I guess what people are going to want to know, and you don't have to give a time. See, people, a lot of people have gotten themselves into a lot of trouble by giving a date and that date coming and going and nothing happening. So more so than what people are looking for in a date than a date is that it's coming. It's come, there's going to be a point in time where everything's going to come out and it's going to explode onto the scene and all of these protocols are now in place to come and um, – Take, take out the old and bring in the new. And they're already there. The, the old systems are gone, per what you're saying. And the new systems are already in place. But people still are operating under the illusion that the old systems are still there. You know, the, 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 okay. the, the media is still controlled. That's a big one, and that's a big reason, part, part of the reason why that there's not a lot, a lot more people that know about this. You know, let me, let me give... Let's address this here, and then if... What I ask people to go do doesn't work, and they want more confirmation, then let's readdress it and and create a new solution to it, okay? First, if you go back and look at those dates, you will see it it already started. It's not going to start tomorrow. It's not going to start four days. That's why I said they really just want to know when are they going to be able to rub coins together. Okay, and that's fine. I'm I'm not saying that's wrong. It's just for some people, they have a certain trigger of when they can finally believe. It's like an authorization. Yeah, you can start believing now. (laughs) Everything's already started. It's been happening. It's just been happening quietly. So what I would suggest is people do what I asked Dee to do. Go back through those filings just for the dates. Okay? Go back through the filings for the dates. And and Dee, 
you sharing what dates you receive certain intel or what dates were significant actually helps them kind of identify, oh, what do I look at? Because someone else might go, oh, you know what? During this time in my brokerage field or in this time during in my legal field or my education field or whatever it was, they'll be able to say, hey, you know what? There are facts here that support this. So you build on the foundation. But if you go back and at least look at the dates of the filing, you will see that it is already started. And a significant one is all of these resignations of the purported, uh, purported governments, plus all the arrests of these finance ministers, resignations of ministry officials, bankers, jumping ship. Go back and look, it already started. It just started yeah. quietly. And you saw events, but you didn't have the complete context. It's already started. And, a lot and, of it and it's steamrolling now, and now it really is steamrolling. When you talk, look at the the, the arrests and the the resignations, especially, you, people need to understand that probably ninety percent of the resignations that are happening within business, within uh, banking uh, and finance, they're not being reported by the mainstream media. So look at the reports we are getting, and times that by you know a hundred. And you've probably got a better idea of just exactly what's happening. The rats are jumping ship, and they are doing it as fast as they can. And as the last month, it's been insane. Yeah, we did something this last month that uh, kind of sealed the new. You know, what can you do now? So we dealt with all the old, but the new was kind of what do we do? The people have these governments that they think are the people's, by the people, for the people, all over the world, okay? Yet they weren't. They were corporations. So we went in and made sure that everything was secure, that the people had a tool, just a temporary tool, one that the other, the private uh, systems could recognize and they couldn't rebut. So we actually filed that at, uh, what was it, D? I think it was November 28th. I think you said November 28th, yes. November 28th, and we sent it off to the White House and the BIS, so all the all the principals, agents, and, and beneficiaries of the private systems has noticed, at least on December 1st, if not earlier, that the people's government, temporary government, was set in place. Plus, they had the declaration of facts that they knew we were going to give to the people to be able to use as they saw fit, if they wanted to. Um, but everything was secure. So December 1st was a big date, November 28th to December 1st, and everything thereafter. Got it. <clears throat> Dee, did you have a qu- – I know you have to go pretty soon. Did you have a question that you wanted to throw in? I mean, um, the the big thing, you know, that – I mean, the consensus across the board is everybody wants to understand um, – what the money aspect of this whole thing means to them. You know, we talk about rubbing two coins together to buy a cup of coffee. The the numbers that are given on the announcements that have gone out, I mean, those are some very big numbers. And based on the way that it's written... Uh, Hold on, Brian. Two, yeah. Brian? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You brought up this point. I meant to address it earlier, it's, so you brought it up again. You guys, it looks like big numbers to you. It looks like big numbers to most people. It is not big numbers. It's a fraction, a very small fraction. And it's sort of like J.P. Morgan getting a $500 million you know, fine and criminal charges for the fraud that they committed. And everyone's going, wow, look at the, look at the fine. It was huge, $500 million. They made over $300 trillion on those transactions. So $500 million was a cost of doing business, and basically it was a cost of a cup of coffee. Sure. For that. Okay. So I'd like for everyone to just put that into perspective, but I'm sorry, let's go forward on the question. Yeah, so so the way that it's written, it says that it's duly verified equity debt against the debtors. So there's there's enough gold and silver, well, more more than enough, because as you said, over three quintillion, five hundred quadrillion. Um, there's over that amount, but it, it's, it also has a statement in there that it's duly verified equity debt against the debtors. So somebody commented, commented that, um, that this is more of a statement of debt owed rather than a promise to pay. And if there were some repayment that would in- occur, it might include things like water and atmosphere cleanup. Can you speak to that? I mean, people, are, everybody wants to know, are they going to get a check? Um, 
And how exactly is, does this part of the um, – does this element of this whole operation uh, come together? Can you speak to that? Yeah. The, the funny thing is, okay, so a, a debt versus a promise to pay. They actually promised to pay in gold and silver any debts because they set up the whole debt system. They made that promise and it was recorded inside the Constitution. And then when they issued the U.S. dollars, anytime someone would use the U.S. dollar, they agreed that it represented a debt and that it was going to be paid in gold and silver. Well, the only person that's ever responsible for an instrument is the issuer. Unless it's, a, it's, it's going to be a sign someone else may collect it, but the issuer is responsible for paying. The only ones that are responsible for paying for a Federal Reserve note is the Federal Reserve. And the major shareholder of the Federal Reserve, Rothschild, London and Paris. Then you have the Rockefellers. You have other groups and organizations, but there's your nutshell. So they're all responsible. The gold and the silver, they already agreed to. That's why they needed the gold and silver to be moved out. If you look at a promissory note, it says, I, Heather and Tucci Giraffe, agree to uh, repay a loan of $200,000, in re- uh, which I agree that I have received, in return for payment in lawful money in the United States of America. Well, no one would, I guess, really kind of connect that those are two different things. Lawful money in the United States of America is something different. And when they would issue money, that's why the Federal Reserve sent $16, what, billion? More. It was more than that. Overseas, during those secret uh, issuances that people found out about, they had to send them over because the banks over there needed those deposited in order as of underwriting for their local currencies, whether it was the euro, the pound, uh, dirham, you name it, yen, all of them. Their system they created made it so that the Federal Reserve was the number one underwriting to everything. Okay. Does that answer? It answers at least part of your question. So what part's in my answer? <laughs> D, you, D, you're, I followed your blog. You have one question left because you have to be, you have to leave in five minutes. Um, jump in whenever you like. If you're still there. D, you there? Yes, I keep muting my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Here is the overwhelming question I've been getting today. Okay. What can we do to help you? What can the people do to help? I have had, I haven't even checked my emails in the last four hours. I have, before then, at least 17 or 18 emails. I have got Skype messages coming out the wazoo of people saying, I want to help. I want to be involved. How can I be involved? What can I do? I know it's overwhelming. And on a personal level, for me, I can only speak for me, is that they've been helping me just by them reaching out. Their energy is the value. Okay, so I recognize what that value is. That's why it's so important for me to return. But uh, they're doing it. They don't even realize they're doing it. It's sort of like asking, when's it going to start? Well, honey, it started a while ago. And you can go back and verify how it already started. At this point, it's the same thing with what can they do. They're doing it. Every time they write a comment on your blog, D, for instance, or on American Kabuki or on, on any of them, they're showing that they're interested. Not only are they interested, but they're saying they're, they want to help now. They're ready to stand up and take responsibility. All they need to do is say, I am, and then be, because with that, they're going to do. Just do. Don't be afraid. I'm here. You're here. Everyone's here. We're not afraid. The more there is, the less fear there is, isn't there? Well said. So we'll figure out the mechanics of what can be done. But, I mean, people don't have limits. Don't have fear. Don't limit yourself. Be creative. And if anyone makes a mistake, we can always correct it. So just figure out the ways to do. I'm so excited about the ways that they're going to figure out to do. I can't wait. I'm the one that's asking, okay, T, ask your readers, when are they going to do, and what are they going to do? Yep. That's what I would like to know. Well, there you go. I'm so excited because I see absolute potential. I think that you have just 
Set me up for my next article tomorrow morning. <laughs> all, all of you removing the shotgun readers out there, there's a test tomorrow morning. You better study up tonight. <laughs> you know your readers are in there 30 times uh, a day so looking, look looking for your most recent post. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm going to be on it all the time. Most awesome readers. Okay, guys, here's, here's a moment of clarity that I would like to share with you both to see what you feel. I, I really want to answer all their questions. And I really want to answer them in a clear, concise manner that fires something up that lets them know how much, how important they are. And so they don't really want to know who I am, who Caleb is, or who Randall is. What they are looking for is proof that, hey, some little guy was able to go in and do something and that means that we can do it, too. Empowerment. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is for you guys to go through the interview, quote, unquote, which... Conversation. The conversation. I'd like for you to go through... First off, I would like for all of our conversations to be recorded. Because I'd be more comfortable knowing that I don't have to think about it. And then you guys can pick at any time what you think, hey, this is what our leaders want to know. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. And that way I'm more comfortable because I'm not thinking about it, and it's more it flows better. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I put that out there for you guys. I'm more than willing to do that. I just ask that things be clear and concise. I really want the people to get what they want at this point uh, because they've never gotten it before. Well, yeah, and the, the funny thing is what, what I think we should do as far as, like, what we put together for the end of this here is we haven't really gone to the whole um, down the path of the the spiritual aspect of this whole thing, you know that. Well, that's a key component. I mean, that's actually the foundation of it all, anyways. And we had to get a crap to get to the spiritual to get to the solution. Yeah. And that's the difference between. Um, I mean, there's a, a, a myriad of differences between. What what has come out over the course of the last few days, and like with the Keenan law, because a lot of people that when they they when they first got their first taste of this, they their minds origin uh, instantly triggered to the Keenan lawsuit, the trillion dollar Keenan lawsuit, because there's a lot of legal stuff, and um, that was the association that their minds made. But the difference between this and that is this is from a purely a, a foundation of um, spirituality. And people being and having connection to their source creator and having the power to uh, control their, themselves and not give that control over anymore to anybody else. And I think that that might be part of an aha moment that people have once they realize. Because, you know, when I, a lot of the questions that I was asking, um, I was, I, the only reason I was really, the biggest reason why I was asking them is because I knew they were pressing questions that people really wanted to know. Um, but I think that the element so far that's missing is that that you, here here's what we now have as the people. It's time to stand up and um, and move forward as one united. And that's 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 part of where we we still need to um, we still need to address, in my opinion. Are you are you recording now? Yep. Okay. So. That is a huge example. If you, what we learned was contrasts. Contrasts actually help you figure out what the solution is. If you don't have one without the other, how are you going to know when even exists, that any of them exist? And I'll give you a case in point. You know, the law is all a fraud. As far as the, the legal systems, I should say, are all a fraud. So to go in there and try to find a recourse or a remedy when the system is designed so you don't have a remedy at all, how do you how do you deal with that? And I knew that was a danger for the people to even try to navigate that stuff. So alleviate it, take it out, put it in its place of truth. And that's what the paperwork and the documents and the actions that we took did. Nobody has to deal with the court again. Not if they don't want to. If they want to create a, a system of accountability, oh God, I'm so excited to see what the people come up with. Mm-hmm. However, the old stuff, it's gone. Okay. So when are people going to be 
granted the tools to be able to empower themselves to stand up. Because the fact of the matter is, I could go out and I could get a DUI today, and I could get arrested, and I could get thrown in jail. And I could tell them all I want, look, you don't have the authority. I didn't hurt anybody. You don't have the authority. I didn't sign off on these laws, and so you don't have the authority to enforce them upon me. I'm still going to get arrested. And there's people that have been there's people that have been um, training on this very kind of thing on how to maneuver around the laws and be able to get out of hot water when you find yourself in it. But without the tools, um, there's those systems are still there. The courts are still there. I'm still going to get a DUI. I'm still going to have to pay five thousand dollars in fines. And there's I mean, there might be something that I can do about it, but I definitely don't have the tools to be able to stand up for um, and have the uh, ability to represent myself in such a way where I can convince them that I know um, the law better than they do, and I know how to that there isn't really a law, and the whole thing's an illusion or farce to begin with, so I'm going to walk away. But that's without knowing what you're doing, that's not going to get me very far. Yeah, absolutely. And that was the whole key was that I wanted to make sure that people were able to go in and have what they needed to be able to handle this kind of situation. So first, number one, the first ingredient of this formula is to have no fear. Okay. Number two is to make sure you have the tools so that you can make sure that that fear, that lack of fear is rooted. So when you get arrested, Brian, you just said, the way that you said what you said, I can arrive at the same goal that you just put in your intent, but if I asking different questions, I, I am me, here's, here's who I am, I'm putting it in writing, you know, okay, so you say you're this, okay, great, show me, show me number one, your employment contract. Because I would love to know who I'm talking to, unfortunately, there's so many people pretending. I mean, that's essentially what it is. And you, I just sent you guys a declaration of facts. Okay? Yeah. The see. declaration of facts is actually how someone goes about using what's been done, but in a current personal matter. Okay, so here's okay, my question. So yeah, keep going. I, I, that brought up a question for me, but I'll let you finish. No, go ahead. Let's deal with the question. Okay. So, all right. So there's all these people pretending right they're they're playing a part they're pretending when do those people when does the system change so much so that the pretending can no longer be tolerated and the people need to and those people that are playing those parts playing those roles whether they're consciously aware of the fact that they're just playing a role or not no longer have the ability to stand there and have to step aside it's already happening it is already happening when we went in and did the investigations, believe me, I went into a courtroom, which they all knew me because I was a former prosecutor there, and I had at least a couple of years of work quality that they could see, so they knew I wasn't just some nutter. They couldn't even paint me as a nutter. Okay? So what happened was I just started asking the right questions, and it took me some time, okay, because I had never had to question the field I was trained in. You know, someone asked me, okay, well, under what authority are you an attorney? Well, because I've got a bar card. Well, great. Okay, where's the bar card that you have? That you have? Where's the agreement that says that you can represent the state? Well, I don't know. Let me go ask my boss. And then all of a sudden, my boss can't even answer that question. He can't show me the agreement where the state of Washington says the prosecutor's office is allowed to represent the a county prosecutor's office is allowed to represent the state of Washington. And then my boss starts freaking out because, wait a minute, you know, and we went in and tested on all that. But to have to have the people go through and test all of that or to try it, and, and believe me, there are people out there that have done it. However, the difference between me doing it and between the rest of them doing it was that the county I was in and the courts I was working in were in a really tight spot because everyone in that county knew me. Everyone in that county knew that there was something going on because I was there. And I was putting myself knowingly in these positions. But I could have just walked right out. 
And it got to the point where the banks had to finally just sort of get the judges out of the situation of the cases by offering, like one judge, his daughter got offered a job to work for the bank. And then all of a sudden they had to recuse himself. And then none of the other judges, I think there's 19 in the county, all of them recuse themselves, one right after the other. If you look at the case, you'll see all these recusal letters. You know why? Because all of a sudden they realize, holy shit, something's going on. But this was months after I've been in the county testing all these cases. Everyone making fun of me. It didn't matter. I didn't care what they thought. But see, I had information that the regular person just doesn't have. So yeah. the question becomes, what can you do? Ryan, there's a very simple way, and that's the draft that I'm sending out to you guys here shortly, is basically a list of questions that you ask them in a very kind and gentle and respective manner. Because I know, and they know, and if they don't know, they're going to find out real quick when they have to go to their bosses to try to get the information, and it's not provided. All of a sudden, they're told, drop the case. Just let it go. Dismiss this. Um, refund this. Whatever it may be, that's the result that happens. So I need to send out that script, basically, is what we did, but it really is a document that's used in the UCC to put these guys in that position. They're absolutely liable. So it's already done. Okay. It's just a matter of people knowing how to do it, and that's what I'll work with you guys on. I'm getting that out. Okay, got it. So, all right. So I'm gonna re- I'm gonna review this document, and um, and that will give me a better idea as to the tools that are gonna be put out there, so people can start standing standing up for themselves. But um, the hot question is gonna be, uh, when are people not gonna have to resort to this document anymore? When is just when are when is the um, residue and the remnants of this slavery corrupt system uh, going to be part of the the past and not still part of the the present the moment this present moment of now which to a lot to many people these these systems still exist and if they don't know how if they don't have this information they they can't have the empowerment to stand up for themselves they can. But they don't know that they have it, so so for, so we can't expect them to use it, and so they could still they potentially will still be um, playing out through these old paradigms with absolutely no um, knowledge of what's taking place and what's being um, you know illegally enforced upon them by systems that, as you say, no longer exist. Yeah, it, I mean, it's already done. The systems are actually changing themselves now. And that's why I say it's so important for people to go back and look, look at those documents because the more they look at those documents and look at the dates and they can start to connect the dots, number one, and number two, they can see the dots were already connected, but they can put them in full context. That's going to be a huge part of building up their confidence and taking the slavery out of the people. That's one. Two is them being, them doing, them writing on the comments, and I can't express how much difference that is making and how that is changing and dissolving the systems that have been enslaving them for all this time. I mean, they are actually doing it right now, whether they know it or not. I'm asking that they know it consciously instead of doing it unconsciously. The only way they can do that is they go and look. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That yeah, that makes sense. Um, I need to review these documents. <laughs> yeah, you just gotta be aware. You just gotta really look. And and what's funny is, is when you you go in and you look at those and you see the dates, they go back to the people that promised this, promised that, and then they look at the dates. They they can recognize, they have the opportunity to recognize, oh, my God, it did happen. It just happened quietly. Because I needed and the trust needed to make sure that the slavery systems actually saw these, had an opportunity to make a different choice in order for the foreclosure to be absolute and unrebuttable, meaning they can't come back and say anything to rebut it. They can't come back and say, oh, no, this didn't happen, because if they do challenge it, they open the door for all the discovery, and they can't afford that. So right now, anything that the people want to declare, <laughs> they, it's it. It's it, because they don't want to open the door to show all the bad deeds and, and what's been going on. 
Got it. Okay. Yeah. I this is make this is bringing up that story that that I, that I told you uh, briefly about my um, the experience that I had yesterday going over to going over to Target to buy the the, the webcam for this call and uh, was was walking to the electronics department and I was I was passing by all the people that were in the store um, completely oblivious to. Uh, all this stuff, you know, the, uh, at least 99% of the people in, in the store I know have, are, aren't up to speed with everything that's going on. And um, I was thinking about how everybody is going to be affected by by, by all of this. There's no way not to be. And um, at that moment, I looked up and I saw a sign in the women's clothing department, and it said, put all the pieces together. Obviously talking about women's clothing, but all of a sudden – I, I understood that there is this, you know, if there is any doubt or any fear at all that this is real, admittedly, even, you know, my little, there's that little devil in my back of my head that's saying, is this all really happening? I get that every once in a while. That's been because there's been this disconnect between the documentation that's been put out and released and, and how it'll all be enforced. And the answer I got instantly um, from my own inner knowing is which which corresponds to all the emails that we've been sending back and forth and um, the a lot of the information that we've covered really is that it's up to us it's up to we the people to enforce it and once everybody knows once it's mainstream once everybody knows that they've been set free then the slavery system no longer has any power because the illusion of it fades away when you shine a spotlight on a shadow the shadow ceases to exist and what that does is it creates the foundation to where now the people have the opportunity to be it has no power and the system no longer has any power over over us so i guess where i'm going with all of this is on a mass level when does the realization that this this um, this these systems are gone uh, start to become a factor, as opposed to what now appears like it's the inner circle of the people with the inside information? We're the only ones that know, so we're the the one, we're the few that can benefit from this. When whereas there's there's a lot of people out there that are broke, hungry. Um, living in poverty, dying in jail for reasons that they they shouldn't be, um, facing all sorts of catastrophic issues in their life that are as a result of this system um, uh, running their lives. When you know, when does all this change? It's already changing. That's the point. It already has changed. It's changing, and it's going to continue to change. The, the speed with which it changes and the visibility with which it changes with the people. And let me give you an example. In Morocco, you know, most people don't know. They're just not privy. I'm not interested, I guess. In Morocco, Morocco is occupied. If you, it depends on who you talk to. They either occupied or they were uh, protectorates. <laughs> okay, so France is over here sitting in Morocco and basically – it got Morocco got pieced apart between a private agreement between France, England, and Spain, and they picked which parts of Morocco they wanted to take. Okay, so the people were sick of the slavery; they were sick of the occupation in their mind, um, and they got together and they did what's called the Green March. There was no violence, no nothing. It makes Occupy Wall Street look like uh, you know a bunch of unruly teens, these guys got together and they walked from north to south, all of Morocco. And in that particular case, they were armed with a Quran. These people got together and their energy and their solidarity and their unity within a very short period of time, France left Morocco because they saw the power, they saw the unity, and there's just nothing greater than the people. I met with China in Hong Kong, and, you know, they were dealing with a whole bunch of uprisings in the employment sectors. People were really tired, and that was one thing the military was very, very fearful of. They can't handle an uprising of, what, 3 billion people? 
Not even if they brought in the aid from outside. They still can't handle that. So if the people just unify and figure out how to unify, and I'm watching them unify. You have people sending emails saying they started a discussion group. They started a community. Your blogs are communities already, and they're sitting there having discussions. They're figuring out ways to be a part of it, ways to do. Well, do, be yourself, and then be yourself with your neighbor, and then be yourself with their neighbor. So that until everyone is together and they're unified, yeah, they're going to fly like a rat into the water as soon as they start seeing the people unifying. And that's what they're watching very, very closely right now. Got it. Got it. So becoming conscious, having having more and more and more and more people become conscious of all this is the key to um, the the information and the awareness that sets us all free, essentially. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Disclosure is the one thing that they are scared of. But the thing they're more scared of is the people. The people knowing who they are and then unifying together for a common goal. Okay. Um, I, I have two. I have two questions on here that I skipped over earlier. I realized from um, KP sent them to me from his readers. That that will address and and there's a couple other things we got to talk about too uh, also but here's the first one it says um, you said that the people don't need to apply for funds that are already theirs so to put it bluntly will the people actually be receiving actual currency if so how and when will that take place and I know that we've already touched on this a little bit but it's you know there's still some misnomers out there as to how that part of the process is going to work. Sure. When we went in to set up everything, take everything back to prime, it was all set in gold and silver. And it was set in gold and silver specifically because that was the mechanism, the value representation that all of the private systems had agreed to and had been working with and holding the people to. Just by your self-declaration that you would pay them back in gold and silver. Nobody has gold and silver sitting in their pockets or sitting in their homes for the most part. But because you signed a piece of paper saying that you, declaring that you would pay them back in gold and silver, they everything had already been agreed to gold and silver. Okay? So when we set up the new government, temporary government, for the people, for them to use just to, during the interim when they figure out if they want a government even, Okay? was that one of the terms was that no currency could be issued. It had to all be in gold and silver. And there was a specific reason for that. Currencies are typically owned by a private system or a private organization or a private entity or a private group or a private individual. Okay? And we, we didn't want that to happen. We wanted to make sure that the people had in their possession – what was duly returned to them. And then if the people decide, hey, Brian, I come together with you and I say, you know, I don't want to carry around this gold and silver in my pocket. So what I'd like to do is let's issue a currency based on that gold and silver. I'm not saying that it, it shouldn't be a currency. I'm just saying, first, the people need to make a decision. And the people should be owning that currency wholeheartedly because it's their gold and silver behind it. So, yeah, my... I want to make sure that the people, and so did Caleb and Randall and others, wanted to make sure the people had the choice and knowingly, willingly, intentionally set that representation. So our intent was that all the value was returned, a value they could rub together and buy a loaf of bread and put a, a tank of uh, gas in the car. Gas in the car, you know, and pay for services. That was the goal. And to build value off of that by growing agriculture food with actual nutrients in it. Ones that weren't, didn't have nanotechnology in it or they were already set with different uh, markers for diseases so that the big pharma could actually sell stuff to you later as that stuff went from dormant to active. You know, these are the kinds of things that we were thinking of. How, does the, how do the people get their value? How can they do this or that? First, you've got to reset it. And then you can issue currencies from there. So if the people say tomorrow, issue a currency, you can do it. 
but it's got to be the decision of the people. Got it. Okay. <clears throat> so let's say that that happens and, and the people say, okay, let's issue a currency so we have the ability to go out and put the tank of gas in our car or um, buy some groceries or whatever it might be. A question that came in from Marlena, Kawila Pele's site, she said, if everybody gets this kind of money, whether it be you know, 500 million, whatever the dollar figure, if there's that much money that's in reserve for every person on the planet, um, wouldn't the next thing that needs to happen simultaneously be that there's disclosure that there's no need for money anymore. She said, because if I have $500 million, I will quit my job, and I believe almost everybody will do the same. So what's going to happen to the hospitals, grocery stores, pharmacies, airports, you name it? People will still need those. Um, it would, it would, how, will, how would we be avoiding um, utter chaos? And I know you've gotten that question yeah. before, but it's important that we put that out there. And, and um I know that uh, we have a question that came in regards to the temporary government, so we'll talk about that next. But why don't you speak to this first if you can, please. Okay. okay, let me use the medical field as an example to answer that question. First off, you have hospitals that haven't been functioning, definitely not in service of the people or the clients that come in. And the doctors are unhappy because of malpractice insurance, all the worries, um, long hours, just, you know, lack of technology, lack of whatever. Here's what I can tell you is that here's an example of how this is going to work. All of a sudden, it's not an influx of money, guys. There's no change in the actual base. It's just being put in different hands. And it's actually evened out into all those different hands. Okay. And those people are going to be reprioritizing. Of course they are. However, if I'm a doctor working in a hospital and all of a sudden I have access to all this technology that's always, it's been hidden. I mean, really mind blowing technology. Yeah, I want to go take a vacation and maybe I might for a week or so or maybe even a month. I don't know. But I do know this. My head is going to be spinning thinking about all these incredible new technologies and how can I implement them and wanting to see them being used in healing people. So there's going to be these new, it's not that the systems that serve the people right now, as far as those kinds of systems, are going to crash. They're not going to exist. You're not going to be able to go to the hospital because no doctors are going to be there. There is so much excitement at what is going to be become available and what can be used. Yeah, there's going to be more doctors on call and you're going to have to force them to go take a break. <laughs> you know, I, there's, mm-hmm. does that answer your question or yeah. give you an example of how this is going to go? Yeah, it does. And it's, I, I asked too because it's a, I asked a similar question to Poof when I did my consultation with him. And he said, I, I asked him, I said, when can I go, when can I comfortably um, go quit my job and so that I can move into something that's more in, line, in, in alignment and in uh, attunement to why I, I came here, you know, why I chose to um, incarnate into into the being that I am now. And he said, um, he said there will be so much opportunity out there that he didn't say when. He said, to shoot, don't don't shoot until you see the whites in the people's eyes. But he did say that when when all when everything um, happens, whatever that may may be. And all of this um, becomes the new reality of the new age, if you will. Then everybody is going to have so much opportunity to go be a part of these new um, uh, technologies or new developments or new um, fields that there's going to be so much opportunity for everybody to get involved in their own way, depending on what they're passionate about, that there's going to be absolutely no shortage of jobs. Absolutely. So, would you agree with that? Absolutely. And there's going to be no shortage. Nobody's going to want for anything. That's kind of the fear that I hear there is how am I going to go get my bag of bread? How am I, who's going to pick up my garbage? Who's going to do this or that? Because then they would have to do it. Or then they would have to, they feel lack. Well, this isn't about lack. This is about abundance. All of a sudden you're going to have these, uh, there's already a technology out there. It's, we call it a cooker in banking. It's a cooker that basically you can put things into this thing and it gives you fuel. No, that's old school. That's actually old technology now. But you never heard about those. You never saw them come out or be produced, not even in uh, minor production. But they were there. So I'm, I'm telling you that there's going to be an abundance of everything. There, I, I agree with Poof on that point, whoever Poof is. I agree with him on that point. 
there's there's going to be abundance everywhere and so much possibility. People are going to rethink about they're going to actually think about what they're passionate about now. Because nobody gets to think about what they're passionate about. When I was in college, it was, oh, don't do that kind of a field because that doesn't pay very much. You won't be able to pay your loans back. <laughs> you won't be able to do this or that. Yeah. You know, so you pick a, a field that is going to be able to do something for you. And in reality, it wasn't what I was passionate about. I, I, I changed into law way afterwards. I went into counting. How boring is accounting? You know, I mean, that's just <laughs> insane. And I'm terrible with numbers, as a lot of your viewers have seen. <laughs> uh, well, it's funny. That, and that's really why, and I, I can only speak for me personally, is why I've now gotten to the point where I'm not hung up on the whole money aspect of this whole thing. I mean, it's easy for me to say, you know, I'm, I have a stable job. I'm, you know, my, my basic needs are met, so it's not as a, a, as big of a concern for me personally than it is for many of the people that are going to listen to this who are facing very hard times. But I think that once these these things happen, I mean, there's that guy. I can't remember his name, but he 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 runs the Venus. I think it's called the Venus Project, and it's yeah, based I, on I know. right. So it's based on society that um, they trade goods and services back and forth, and that's how. Everybody gets their needs met and is, is able to live a life of abundance. And when you have that kind of money that's on the table, that's now um, the biggest distribution of wealth since the, his, his, the since the creation of humanity is happening right now. Um, so for me, I'm like, well, I want to get to the point where we don't even need money anymore, where money is yeah, a non, I mean, money's a non-issue. Venus, I love the Venus Project. In fact, I worked on that financing. Uh, early on in my career, and I watched it get buried. I watched it intentionally. Yeah, you know, bring in the applications, bring in their, bring in their uh, architects, uh, bring in their their strategists, bring them all, all in, and, and they did that to figure out how they were going to do it, and then they buried the whole thing. So these poor guys thinking that they're going to get financing so they could actually help humanity, they had really good hearts. They still have really good hearts. So that's kind of the point is, you know, everyone sits there and goes, what's going to happen to loans? What's going to happen to student loans? What's going to happen to mortgages? Guys, no loans were ever made. I don't care if it was a student loan, a private loan, a commercial loan, whatever. It never was made. Not unless someone had two coins in their pocket, which they could show how they earned it, and then they loaned it over to, you know, Joe Smith so he could go buy his bag of bread. No loans were made, so there's nothing to pay back. And the same goes for these debts, you know, government debt or the debt in the United States of America. It's all contrived. There is no loan. No debt can exist unless a loan was made. That's the key question to ask. Okay, great. I have no problem paying back the, paying back a debt, but first show me where the loan was made. Show me the loan. Can you, defi- this, can you define a loan, this, Heather? What is what is a loan? I mean, in, in legal legal terms, um, define a loan so people understand what a loan is. Because there's a lot of people out there right now that are raising their eyebrows because they got a lot of loans and they're drowning in the payments to keep up with them, just to keep their 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 balance. Not even bring it down, just leave it the same because their interest rates are so high. So I think that if you could explain that a little bit so that people understand um, how this is going to affect them, then um, I think that would be very helpful. Yeah, I mean, and don't worry about it. People don't may not know the definition, but I can personally, from personal experience, guarantee that judges don't even know the difference between a loan and a debt. Okay, so... We'll go through, and basically, a loan is, it's an, it's a sum of money that is lent to someone else. It's, a, it's the act of giving money or property or whatever it is, just another party, another person, in exchange for a promise that they'll pay, you, pay it back or return it. That's what a loan is. The debt is amount of money that's been loaned that is due for payment. So one is actually the action of giving money or property or whatever it is. The other one is is a, a debt, a, a, a credit on someone's book and a debit on another book. It's something that was actually loaned to you that you borrowed that you have to pay back. And you can show 
you can show the transactional records or the, the history of what was given and what wasn't given. Got it. Right? Well, Got they can't. Yeah. That alone was made. That's why they were stuck in all the investigation and all the uh, caseloads that we did. There was one specifically with KeyBank that we did, and the Federal Reserve, San Francisco was involved, and, and they freaked out the minute that the alleged count holder, the alleged debtor, asked them, hey, great, I'll pay this back or I'll extend it, I'll put my house on it as soon as you show me that a loan was made. And there's a specific way to show that a loan was made. Three things. So they couldn't do that. They started to freak out. And they actually went in, and it was my dad and my mom that offered to go ahead and try it, to test it out. And they got hit hard They because of the work. They recognized what was going on at that point, the banks did. Wow. So to answer your question, there is no loans to pay back. There's no uh, national debt. Quote unquote, there's no state debt, none of it. Okay. No so, so Federal Reserve notes are those money? Is that that's not money? That's debts, right? Yeah, that's the awesome thing is that who issues a Federal Reserve debt? But it's all over the paper. It says Federal Reserve debt. They're the issuer. They're liable for it. However, through a series of deceptive acts and practices. They made it so that the people consented to take on that liability. That's why they print up money like it's nothing, because it is nothing. Got it. Okay. So, um, all right. That all makes sense. Um, thank you for clarifying that. Um, you mentioned before you mentioned temporary governments. Mm-hmm. And I believe in your papers, you is that what you refer to as the CV, CBAC was the acronym? Are those the same things? Can, yeah. you, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Basically, we wanted to make sure that the people believe that their government exists, right? That serve the people. It's by the people, for the people. Whereas in reality, in commerce, I should say, the slavery systems, the principles and, and beneficiaries set it up to where everything was a corporation and hidden within commerce. And so the only way that you could actually go in and make sure that people had what they wanted or an opportunity to create what they wanted was to go in and secure in that slavery system, uh, the registry that the slavery system was using, I should say, was to register the ownership in commerce of the people's governments. So we created it actually, CVAC, we use, yeah, Creations Value Asset Centers. It actually was a solution that I had worked on with some of the trustees the original solution that was proposed and reviewed by the principals, agents, and beneficiaries was a claim process, and it was called the uh, uh, um, claimant's value asset claim, the creditor's value asset claim, actually, excuse me, creditor's value asset claim. And then when this all went back to prime and we realized where the solution really was, it was all the way back to prime, zero point. I just had already created the logos. We had already created the structures. So I went in and changed it from creditors' value asset claim to creations value asset centers. So it's just something representative of the of what we've got. So the government, we needed to make sure that it was a framework that was fluid, non-restrictive, non-limited, except for what the people wanted. One was that the people were the owners of it. Two, that the sole purpose of the governments was to serve the people and nobody else. No special interest, no self-interest. And three, that it would not abrogate, subordinate, subjugate, violate, invade, or assert the people's standing authority and value and the rights. That's basically your framework. So we just went in and registered what the people already thought was. Okay, so are are those are these new temporary the temporary governments? In, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So so you were talking about the the temporary governments and the fact that um, uh, why they needed to be set up. I think. Yeah, I mean, essentially, what we did was we went in and registered in commerce what the people thought have always existed. Their governments for the people by the people. Okay. 
that's what we registered. That's the whole key to our formula was registering what what already is. Okay. So are these are these temporary governments that are set up? Are these already in place and are are they already functioning, or are they just still, still being set up behind the scenes right now? Well, the the people see that that is actually set up, and that is what they've been using. Uh, as the legal precedent, the lawful precedent for this new restructuring. So, Heather, um, can you can you talk a little bit about we we read about the UCC and a few of the documents that you put out. Um, can you talk about what exactly is the UCC and and what kind of tools uh, do they have that that you guys are using to um, implement a lot of the stuff that One People's Trust has been working on? Yeah, I mean, essentially, the UCC is a, is a commercial registry. And it also has uniform commercial codes that the registry is operated by. To register property, to transfer property, to assign property. Okay? It also secures rights. Everybody is under commerce. Every Commerce runs everything. So what happened was they established this commercial registry, these commercial codes, and the people paid for it. They prepaid for it. The commercial code, there was, there is a private owner. Right now the private owner is actually all the people equally on the planet. However, prior to that, little, little uh, known to anyone, was that there was a former private owner. However, that private owner would never show forward because then it's absolute proof of the slavery that they had everybody under. So that was, that's sort of the position, that's the approach we took to everything. Put them into a corner where they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. And then by the grace of the people, a new choice could be made. Okay. All right. So, who's left that's still fighting against all that? I mean, we've we've talked about it before. Everything that needed to be done is done. Um, but there's, it, it appears to me. I mean, I don't watch. I don't. I try to avoid the news and watching CNN at all costs. But obviously, there's somebody out there that still controls the media based on all the garbage they're still putting out. Who's left that's still fighting tooth and nail against all of this? And um, what's left to be done in order to get these last, um, you know, these, 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 the last of these people out of the way? Yeah, sure. Okay, first you have to understand that all the principals, beneficiaries, and agents of the former systems, the private systems, used against the people, people are falling on their sword right now as Poof, whoever Poof is, went in and put it. They are falling on their sword. They'd rather fall on their swords but still have that private system up. So they have some chance of getting some kind of benefit and not have to worry about the accountability. So it's really the whole system, or the whole group of beneficiaries. However, there's actually people within the principal, the beneficiaries, and the agent that no longer want to live by that system. And actually, if they had known when they were born that they had a choice, they may have chosen differently, but they're so indoctrinated with and brainwashed with the system, and then they're put into a position where they're compromised to where they have to live with that system. Well, it's no longer that way now, and that's because of the people, the people waking up, not just to themselves, but also to the games that are played. I mean, watch, look at the Connecticut issue. People have been dissecting that thing <laughs> down to the ground. And there's actually nothing left for them to dissect. They already know the answer. So it's the people. It, right now, everything rests on the people. Being and making a choice to do. So just be aware of everything. Call it into your consciousness. Say, what do I know? And then you're going to get all the information you wanted and didn't want so that you know. Mm-hmm. Does that answer your question? <clears throat> yeah, it does. Yeah, it, it it. I mean, it takes knowledge as power to a whole other level because we're not talking knowledge here. It's it's wisdom, and um, it's really as simple as being. 
That's it. And we've, yep. you, you know, and, and you're reading your emails back and forth, back and forth. I mean, if, if I had a dollar for every time that, um, the word being was in there, uh, I, I probably wouldn't need my five billion. <laughs> but it's no, so, you'd actually have way more. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true. And, and, you know, we talked about it a few minutes ago. We'll make sure that's included in the call is the, the, you know, the, the spiritual aspect of this whole thing is, um, so tremendous, and it's really what creates the foundation for all of it to even exist. Because um, the people don't—they—they they never have had to answer to anybody. You said in a conversation that we had the other day is, uh, did who did these people? Uh, they didn't come out of the womb with flags on their butts. I think you said. And they never signed a contract that said they had to answer it to anybody. So everybody really only needs to answer to themselves and, and to their creator. There, there is no – everybody else that's been put in the middle of that to create this illusion um, is simply that, just a part of the illusion. So uh, when you talk about this from a spiritual standpoint, you know, where, where we're headed is we're headed in that direction where – the foundation has now been set for everybody to step into the power of who they truly are and be the nature of uh, the, and, and the essence of um, uh, what they are at their core, which is soul and spirit. Right? Right. So, that's the core. That's the prime. And that's the prime. That's so, what they can't reflect. Yeah. Um, I'm getting a question from American Kabuki right now. On on Skype, it says uh, the CVAC, the CVAC document mentions five hundred million million per person. Is that a separate sum? Five hundred million. In order to get the temporary government up, you got to have some kind of backing, right? Right. So out of everyone's five billion plus every almost every person on the planet, except for the what they refer to as the claw, has an extra five billion in gold and silver on top of that. So it really is ten billion. Well, you got to have some kind of funds to start your government, right? Right. So, five hundred million from every person on the planet was appropriated to be able to fund their government, so that they could go in and start the repossessions. They could go in and start the systems of treasury, the systems of protection, the systems of education, technology. You got to have something. So, five hundred million was just the number. That we chose it can always be changed by the people. Okay, so this is million was for what they allocated out of their holdings to start their systems or to have their systems run that they always thought were running. So this is for the organic government. Yes, but I had to register that we had to register their government in a commercial system in order so that the old commercial system couldn't run anymore. Okay, got it. So this is this is the one that's taking taking hold of the assets of the old government. This is the one that collapsed all the other corporations operating under the guise of government. Okay. However, this is like I said, temporary so that the people could actually establish the organic governments, if any. So what we're remo- we're removing the legal fictions, right? Yep, absolutely. We had to col- we had to collapse the legal fictions by stating the legal fictions as the property and ownership of each of the people individually and collectively. Okay. Equally. Got it. I got that. Okay. <clears throat> that makes sense. Um, Heather, uh, you you mentioned earlier we're 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 on the record, but we're, this isn't going to go on the um, on the conversation on the um, on the what we put out on the blogs. Uh, about the gold, you made mention to the fact of, the, of your conversation with Betts about the gold and the whole teleporting thing. I mentioned asking you about that the other night. Are you going to – we we didn't – I mean, that was the most um, – out of everything that I read, that and the, the, the communications back and forth about the whole Sheldon Idol thing and the council meeting was the two things that floored me the most, but I didn't ask you at all about it yesterday. I don't know why. Are you going to tell us the whole story, the whole story with that? Or Yeah, I mean, essentially, in doing the work that we did going back to crime, once you went back to crime and really absorbed it so that you remembered it and you knew it, 
all of a sudden all these doors opened up <clears throat> that actually every being on the planet has been engaging in, mainly when they're in a state of sleep. So I was able to see the universal contracts of the true being of each and every person. And that's what actually helped me understand the different roles in trying to figure out how to establish the framework for the system of accountability. Okay, because I'm sitting in a courtroom where a judge that is so dirty because they're taking bribes or because they're participating in the enslavement knowingly and willingly, that how do you have a person like that sit there and judge somebody else for what they may have done or didn't do? Okay. So I had to be able to go back, and so I asked to remember what I knew. And all of a sudden, all this information started to come forth, and I was able to, uh, you're right, I don't sleep. Because when I'm sleeping, I'm still working, but in a different area. And I'm actually re remembering what's done. And I'm actually consciously there and setting forth what I want to set forth. So it's basically almost a fusion of every part of your being in every existence of creation's universe. So, you know, you hear about multiple yous, right? It actually exists, and it's the same, same basis, as above, so below, as below, so above. And they've used this template to establish the slavery systems, because it's something that inherently inside, within us, resonates in order for us to absorb it and accept it, whether it was knowingly or unknowingly. So when you go in and you start to ask yourself, what do I know? You're going to get the answers. But you got to make sure your intent is truly set and that you're set with alignment. And all of a sudden, you're going to start knowing things that Sheldon, for instance, is bringing forth. And you're going to find out that you're actually participating at a whole another level. Got it. Yeah. How much gold did you teleport out of there? <laughs> <laughs> Everything. All of it. So Everything. One, so one, one night they went to bed and they had a bunch of gold. And the next day they woke up and had one tungsten bar with a love, with a love note attached to it. We didn't even wait for them to go to bed. Okay, so one moment it was there. The other moment, the next moment it was gone with the tungsten bar in its place with a love note attached to it. Yeah, and I've got to find the love note for you guys. <laughs> Just as, you know. And how, how... <laughs> Oh, it's just such a <laughs> such a crazy story. I'm just having a hard Look, time how, with my head. How it happened it. was this. How it happened was this. I was sitting there thinking about the the dis, uh, distribution, okay? And I'm sitting there going, "There's it, it, this happened actually right after I got your interview with uh, uh, excuse me your consultation with Poop." I sat there and I listened to it and I understood that there were they had gone in and cut deals. And I said, okay, what kind of deals, how far did these deals go? Because there were things that were being reported that just didn't resonate with me as far as, hey, this is a local, a planetary thing, because it's not. Not with the stuff we took back to Prime. You know, you're talking about all of creation's universe, and inside of creation's universe are all the multi-universes, super universes, whatever you want to call them. Okay, there's only one universe. It's creation's universe with all these bits and parts. And I do know that my particular role in all of this that's going down now was known a long time ago. And I at least know that it's been known for 10 years. I was offered a job out of the blue in bank trade and finance. No history in bank trade and finance other than working for a pension consulting firm which was owned by a good Greek family friend of ours. Other than that, you know, no history. And I took the job because it was overseas and I really wanted to get out of here. And as I looked at the opportunities that were set up, and then I was actually steered and told to go take the job at the prosecutor's office in order to assist with a bigger plan. All I knew was I was supposed to go to the prosecutor's office 
and establish myself and do really excellent work. And that's what I did. It wasn't until after I was done with that and went back into bank trade and finance that I figured out what the purpose was. And so here we go. Here it unfolds. That's why I was able to do the job I did and use my house as a test case and go in there with the confidence that I had. Sure. And the lack of fear. So when I go in and I'm looking at all this stuff, you will all start to remember who you are, not just here, but as at the core center of source. And that you've actually been playing multiple roles in multiple universes. Like and you have the, access all, to that knowledge. You just you got to accept it. Yeah, that, that's mind blowing. I, it's it's um, um, I keep wondering when that will happen, you know. And um, but yet it's, it keeps coming in bits and pieces, you know. And that's how it usually comes. It, it builds that. It's sort of like how collective conscious works. You know, everything sort of inches its way, right? So at one point they say you can live to be 35 years old. Okay. I expect to live 35 years old. All of a sudden you have someone live 40 years old. And then all of a sudden uh, the age limit moves to, let's say, 45. And it inches. That's sort of how this part works as far as the acceptance of who you are. Look, I know. I just know that I am in so many different parts of the universe. I accepted it. I knew it from within. I may not know the mechanics. I may not remember the different parts, but I just know that that was absolute truth for me. So I accepted it. And then at that point, I chose with absolute responsibility and liability to remember all of it. And that's what's been happening. And I've been speechless more this last week than my entire life. Uh, Is that just the inability to talk or just a... Uh, something like uh, an, uh, being awestruck. I literally could not form sentences, no matter what language I tried. Okay. Okay, I couldn't form sentences. I had a real hard time focusing because I wanted to. It's like reading a book. You get you really get involved in this book, and you just can't put it down. I go and I hide in the bathroom for my kids, for my husband, for many responsibilities. But God, I've got to read the book. Got to finish it because I, I feel it within me. That's the kind. That's the only way I, I can describe it, and it doesn't do justice. Okay. And you get so absorbed with this that all of a sudden everything see, you see the irrelevance of everything. Yet you see the beautiful relevance in the irrelevance to get you to that place of knowledge, that place of knowing. It took every irrelevant for you to get to the relevant. So I understand this veil now of forgetfulness. And I actually dealt with that in uh, November and we filed it in December Caleb and I were the only ones that chose to because it just didn't resonate with Randall. But Randall's older than us, and he has a different paradigm that he, um, paradigm parameters that he has to deal with. Just in the mechanics of it, okay? But it's still the same kind of thing we have to deal with. And I made a conscious choice. I didn't. I knew it only took one because we're all one, anyways. We're all part of self of the Creator, so it only took one. However. Caleb stood up and said, hey, I know this to be true, and he signed on it too. And we were able to do something and register it in there that reset everything, gave everyone a, ch a chance to make a different choice and ledger out their liabilities from their past choices. Grace. Absolute grace. We, we called it the grace mandate during this last part of this phase. So Heather, um, we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, obviously, and I, you know, I can't thank you enough for your commitment and service and years of blood, sweat, 
tears and um, absolute um, truth and uh, effort that you've put toward everything that you've done. And I know that we, um, the work is just getting started. There's going to be a whole lot more to do. And people, you know, like we talked about with the earlier, they're going to want to know what they can do to help. And um, we're going to do, we'll do a lot, we'll do more of these calls, these conversations with Heather, and we can do it in, in a roundtable fashion where we can bring in live uh, live questions. Is that something you'd be interested in, in um, being a part of, Heather? Yeah, and I would also offer that Miles, People want to know, they want to see examples. They want to see someone who got in the water, splashed around, and proved that it was safe to go in and that there was no sharks. Okay? So what I would say is, is that give people examples. That we tested everything in our own personal lives so that we took the brunt of it and we would take the liability if we made a mistake. And I think that people would really benefit just from hearing the example and inspire them to know that they're just as significant. They hope, and I, I have a real hard time with the word hope, because hope indicates something that you don't already possess. And the thing is, the people are their own hope, so accept that hope served its purpose, now let it go, because it already is. It is when they be, and it is when they do. And I just ask that in their quest for figuring out how they want to do it, have no fear. Don't fear mistakes. You're going to make them, and it can be fixed. And if people do that with absolute love and grace and gratitude, then we're going to all help each other to figure out how to do this in harmony and in oneness. Great. Now, okay, perfect. What what can you say to um, where are we headed? Can you paint a paint a picture of what you think that that um, what people have to look forward to? I mean, obviously, we've already talked about it. A lot of the changes have already been implemented. Um, there, this this is the reality that we're living in now. But what do the people have to look forward to as far as how this world is going to be different from? Um, once the freedom is totally and absolutely uh, removed, uh, the, excuse me, the, the slavery systems have been totally and completely removed, what's, what's the world going to look like at that point? What do people have to look forward to? What, what, uh, I'm, trying to re- I'm trying to avoid using the word hope here, but um, what should people be excited about? First off, have no expectations, because most of the expectations – will not match what they experience. It's actually going to be something they cannot fathom right at this moment for most of them. Some can, and some have seen it. Some have actually experienced it already. And at this point, when people stand in responsibility and liability, it changes how they function, and it changes what you can understand to actually be happening. So... Brian, you would act differently if you knew that we were sitting there watching every step, right, that you make, as opposed to just being in a, in a room by yourself and not being held accountable to anyone. <clears throat> that right there is a ground-shaking element to everything that's been done, because now at this point people feel safer, they start trusting, and There's no need. Distrust is going to be removed from their verbiage. Hope is going to be removed from their verbiage. Need, want, those are all words that indicate they don't have something yet. And they're going to start realizing they already have it, and they actually had it all along. So you're going to have you're going to have incredible new uh, architecture. You're going to have incredible new agriculture systems, you're going to have incredible new amounts of creativity and invention that they want. So would free energy be included in that, Heather? Yeah, all that, all the free energy stuff has been shelved. I mean, when people would bring those kinds of inventions in, and a lot of them were inspired from a whole different 
part of the universe, creation's universe. And when that technology started to show up, people needed funding for it, and the banks were able to go in and maneuver. I mean, I can't, ha- I can't tell you how many times I heard stories, and then actually to help some people with Rumsfeld going in and taking that, <laughs> taking those particular inventions and then either buying them out or making it so the person who was in jail and their patents would run out. So all of that stuff is sitting there and you're going to have free energy. You're going to have no want for healthy food. People are going to end up having these magnificent gardens in their own home. The whole system of how we live is changing. The whole system is going to be self-sustaining. Sounds like there's people that are behind the scenes working around the clock tirely, tirelessly to make sure that um, all of these things are in order and in place to um, go live when a lot of this stuff comes out into the open. Is that would that be accurate? Yeah, they. It's already ready to go. It's actually been ready to go for at least I was made aware of. It was ready to go about four months ago. And that's why we needed to make sure that the foreclosure was done and that there was an opportunity for them to come in and basically say, no, that's not how it is. They never did. Um, So the foreclosure is done and set. That was the end of October. So once November hit, it was a matter of, okay, what can, what tool can we use to be able to bring this in? So, that was the importance of securing the government, the people's government, to the people so that they could have the tools to go in and do what they need to do without uh, a legal recourse type of action from the powers that were in these purported courts. So everything's ready to go. And at this point, it was a matter of disclosure, and it naturally happened. This disclosure really naturally happened. This is just the start of it. And it's so that the people have an opportunity to go back and look and say, wow, you know, we were so disappointed that certain dates didn't meet our expectations. And yet they're going to find those dates actually did happen. They had to happen quietly, though, in order so that the powers that were couldn't use old methods to discredit or bury them before they were actually finished. Got it. So, got Because you... you um Everything had to be quiet, or else the information would be too um, – if it were out in the public, then the people that were working against it would have a greater ability to defeat um, some of the stuff that uh, that had to get done. Is that pretty much how yeah. the way it went down? Okay. You know, we did this so quiet behind the scenes. The only ones that knew were the powers that were, and we experienced – really severe pressure, really severe pressure. And I can't even imagine what it would have been had we even tried to go public with it. And we would have been so spread thin trying to go public with it all that it just wouldn't have gotten done. So I'm really happy, actually, really satisfied with the way that things were done. People are now going to have the opportunity to see that it was actually done. And then all of a sudden they're going to say, wait a minute, we're, we're ratified. And not only that, but the people that actually went out and gave that information, believing that information to be true, are now going to be vindicated because it actually was true. And now you're going to see that the military, the, what did you call it? The, the light military, I can't remember the term you guys used. Um, the federal marshals? Oh, the positive military group. No, the positive military. You're going to see that they've actually been moving for a couple of months now, getting into position, at least since September. And it's just this symphony, this magnificent divine symphony that's being played out so that people could really have a chance to make different choices that were in the former systems. Some of them are checking out, and you're seeing them right now. You're watching it happen. You just don't know the context that it's happening in. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I'm i going to uh, go out on a limb and say that uh, we have a lot to look forward to here. <laughs> but I think that 
from the gist of from the gist of what you're putting down and and gosh so much of what I learned I've learned from you over the course of the last couple of days is you know the more that we can stop worrying about everything that's happened and stop trying to anticipate or create some expectation for the way it's going to look like sometime in the future that um, it's in everybody's best interest to start living in the moment and be this change now like Gandhi said that we want to see in the in the world and it, the real change happens inside of us and when um, when we all change from the inside we are our, our outside world automatically transforms and, and every fa- facet around us because um, the, the real reality is that the outside world is is inside of every, each and all of us. You know, we we create. Everybody sees the the has their own perception of the world, and we um, we create the world around us. So it's time for everybody to stand up and and understand that whether you realize it or not, this is happening. It's happening now, and it's time for for us to um, be aware of it and just be. Just be in this moment and take it in because it's beautiful. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. I've been floored over the course of the last few days of how much I've learned uh, as a result of our discussions. And um, I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, we have the opportunity, the opportunity to continue these and um, we'll, we'll create a forum that uh, allows us to um, take questions that people have. I know there's going to be a lot of unanswered questions and that's okay. Um, there's a lot to cover, uh, but if your questions weren't answered uh, as a result of this call, don't worry. We're going to have an email that we're going to put out uh, where you can email your questions, and we can make sure that we get to those on our next um, conversation. So, Heather, I really appreciate you being here. And, uh, gosh, it's been so awesome to get to know you, and I know that our conversations and our work together is going to continue. And um, I'm just so grateful, and I thank you so much for being on this call. Is there anything else that you want to close with? Just all of this is done without prejudice and in absolute gratitude and with absolute love and unconditionally always. So I want to thank everybody for being on the call here with Heather. Thank you to Dee from Removing the Shackles and uh, to American Kabuki for everything that he does. And um, uh, we're going to go ahead and get this up on the uh, blog site. Uh, T-O-P-P-T questions at gmail.com is where to send your questions uh, to so we can make sure we get to them on our next talk uh, with Heather and others. That's T-O-P-P-T questions at gmail.com. Brian here from the American Kabuki Ground Crew. Thank you for the time. Thank you for being and I look forward to moving forward on this journey with each of you. I love you. Good night. Thank you.